uh, my mother's side and actually on my father's side too, um, they, they, were, they both come from uh, secular Jewish movement in Eastern Europe and a fundamental belief that became part of their DNA uh, was that uh, the Jewish people will never be safe unless it's impossible to discriminate against anybody, unless the world is, is, is right. Um, and, uh, and I think, I think they were attracted to their politics because of that, not the other way around. Uh, and after the political p p party really fell apart, they, they still held this, these beliefs and so did most of their friends. Did you go to a, a shul where you sat to? Uh, yes, I, I went to Yiddish. Uh, uh, Yiddish school. I never, secular, secular. Yes, school. although you know we didn't use that term. When I, ju I just said secular Jewish movement, that's a term we use now. Uh, there, that term wasn't there then. It was just we're we're Jewish. Uh, they they weren't self conscious about the fact that they they were atheists. They were still Jewish. It, it all made sense. But I went to uh, Yiddish shul to the Sholem Aleichem Club. Uh, and learn Yiddish, unfortunately not as well as I sh should have liked. Um, but I went to Hebrew school for one year because I wanted to be bar mitzvah. My parents really didn't push it, but I wanted to get the presents. So I went to Hebrew school for one year. I memorized my Haftorah. I just memorized the sounds. Of it. I didn't know what it meant then, and I still don't know what it means now. I just got up on the, you know, at the pulpit and just mumbled some words. Not very well because the rabbi kept kicking me under the, you know, <laughs> under the pulpit. It was really hurting me up there. Um, uh, I grew up during the McCarthy period. And that's actually a very important aspect because in Philadelphia, I grew up with the sure knowledge that the world was out to get us, which they were. And uh, the FBI came to our door several times. My parents lost their jobs several times. Um, my father got beaten up. He was a construction worker. Uh, and Philadelphia was not like New York. In New York, there were neighborhoods of left-wing people, and people could relate to each other in their own neighborhoods. Not in Philadelphia. The, the left was isolated from itself, fa family by family, except that we formed a group called Teens Ahead. I mean, we didn't, our parents did, just to bring the kids together from all over Philadelphia, called Teens Ahead. And that group s sort of clung together and um, we did things like we went to the 1958 March on Washington called by A. Philip Randolph, which was, we didn't know it, but it was a predecessor to the 1963 March. Uh, and we were very active in uh, picketing Woolworths. Uh, this was before the sit-ins at Woolworths in the South. This was uh, not about lunch counter, you know, African Americans being able to buy lunch. This was about Woolworths wouldn't hire African Americans. In Philadelphia, they'd take their money, they could sit anywhere, eat anything, if they wouldn't get hired. Uh, so we, we picketed. And this was also during the time of um, Frank Rizzo being the police chief. So we got beat up by him a couple times. So SNCC, what got you, I assumed you were going to college, that's when you came in contact with New Left and or SNCC activities prior to COFO summer or what? Well, how did there's you two ways of answering that. One way, I just did. <laughs> you know, I never thought of not going south. That's what we did. Uh, that's, you know, what, what, I, what I came out of. 
Where were you going to school at the time? Uh, Antioch College. Mm -hmm. And this was in 1961. And Chuck McDo, who was the chair of SNCC at the time, visited uh, Antioch uh, to visit his girlfriend. Not to give any speeches or anything. And I sat down with him to eat lunch in the cafeteria. And the next thing I knew, I was in Albany, Georgia as an organizer. This is 61. 61. 61. Um, and, you know, so the, the mechanics of it was Chuck McDo recruited me. But I, I would have gone some kind of way because that's just what we did. Um, in Southwest Georgia, uh, I uh, worked on the Albany project. Actually, we called it the Southwest Georgia project by the time I got there, doing voter registration. Uh, also, uh, anti-segregation uh, stuff in, in public accommodations, which became very rare. SNCC just concentrated on voter registration after that. There was a whole split about demonstration about mobilizing or organizing, and to make a long story short, organizing won out. Uh, I just condensed five years of history there. Um, my lung collapsed while I was in Albany, and I had to leave, uh, and I went back to Antioch uh, to recuperate. Uh, this was now late 62. Two. And um, so it was shortly after that, still late 62 or early 63, uh, was my first time coming to Washington not for a demonstration. I was used to coming from Philadelphia to come to Washington pretty often for one demonstration or another at buses. Also gave, gave us a chance to make out as we were teenagers, you know. Uh, but, um, my first job in Washington was as a community organizer at Southeast Neighborhood House mm. in Barry Farms. Ralph Furtick. With Ralph Furtick. I worked with Ralph Furtick. And, and I met Charlene Krantz, who was a high school student at the time running Students Against Discrimination and also working at IPS. I, I also, I'm sorry, also working at Southeast Neighborhood House. I'll get into IPS later. I was at Southeast Neighborhood House when uh, Kennedy was shot. So that gives you the time period. Any memories about Ralph Furtick? Yes. Uh, he was a type that I hadn't ever met before, really. He was a genuine liberal and a social worker. Um, and I didn't quite know what to make of him because I came out of, you know, organizing. And at, South, at Southeast Neighborhood House, I, I found myself sitting around the table with Willie Hardy, who I think ran for city council later. She was a social worker. And others talking about families and how to help them, you know, one by one. Uh, and. I felt, I found that rather confusing, you know, because I just knew that if we organized and changed the system, they would be helped. The biggest issue that we organized around at the time was the man in the house rule at Barry Farms. And what it was, if you, uh, I guess we're married, you, you couldn't have a, a, you couldn't be living with a man and be in uh, public housing. Uh, and this worked to split up families and, uh, you know, split up fathers who wanted to stay and, and uh, help raise the kids. Uh, so we organized there, and I wish I could remember the names of the people. I, right after this, I will remember their names. Some very, very courageous people uh, living in, in Barry Farms. 63. 63. Uh, the um, head of the housing authority at that time was a fellow named Walter Washington. 
who we demonstrated against because he was supporting the man in the house rule. He became Washington's first mayor when it got home rule. But during this time, I also uh, got involved with uh, Julius Hobson and Hilda Mason and uh, 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 Butler, uh, Josephine. Josephine Butler, who, who later had the Paul Robeson house. Uh, work, you know, helping the home rule movement. In fact, I wrote an article that appeared in, in uh, the newspaper of Progressive Labor, of which I was not a member, and it was called uh, America's Last Colony. Uh, at the time, if I'm remembering this correctly, uh, people appointed by the federal government we're beginning to write what would become the charter of D.C. I forget whether this started under Eisenhower or Kennedy, but I, I remember that at one point there was great hope that the charter that they were writing for the city, that it would, the running of the city, the government, would be based on something called advisory neighborhood commissions, that the power would be there. Um, and, of course, that kept being progressively watered down, but we still have ANCs, and I think all that was, was that's left in the charter of their power was they shall carry great, great weight, I think that's the term, uh, when it comes to zoning matters. Uh, so we were kind of disappointed when the charter was finally finished. In 60, uh, so 63, did you, was that the job you kept until you, until Kofo summer? No. Um, I left, now, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. At the time, uh, in my mind and in several others, there wasn't much distinction between SNCC working in the South and what we were doing in Southeast Neighborhood House. It seemed to be part of the same thing. After all, Washington was the South, and it was more the South then as it is now. What Kennedy said of Washington at the time is that it has all the uh, charm of the North and the efficiency of the South, <laughs> and it was true. It was a Southern city. It was basically like Mount Bayou in Mississippi, which is a, a, a black Southern community, and the real Washington was that. And here was Ralph being a white liberal and me working for him, you know, in uh, at Southeast Neighborhood House. Uh, after Southeast Neighborhood House, in late 63, um, I went t back to work for SNCC in Mississippi. And um, I helped set up what has come to be called Freedom Summer. But at the time, we didn't call it that. It was just the SNCC summer project. Uh, I was one of the first whites actually allowed to organize for SNCC in Mississippi. They still hadn't decided whether whites should be allowed, but I had, a lot of I had had a lot of experience. So they sent me to Holly Springs by myself. I was a project of one for a while. Uh, but having passed through Holly Springs before was Frank Smith who had, you know, later on became a city council member, who I worked for. I was his first campaign manager and his first uh, executive assistant, you know, years later. Um, Holly Springs, uh, for some reason, uh, became the center, and, and, and this really started during the summer uh, of 64, although at the time, you have to understand, we call it Freedom Summer. It seems like a very, nice, a very neat package. But we didn't know it was Freedom Summer. I mean, I, we, a lot of us were there before, and we stayed after. This was just a project where a lot of white kids came down to do a lot of stuff. But we didn't start stuff then, except for the Freedom Schools. We continued stuff that we had started, and when they left, we continued it after them. But 
around the Holly Springs project, uh, working there was Ivanhoe Donaldson, uh, who left there uh, and who then became the campaign manager for the first black mayor of just about every city you can name before he settled in Washington. Frank Smith, Charlie Cobb, uh, was in and out, although he wasn't stationed in Holly Springs. Um, Bill, Cleve Bill, Sellers. Bill Hobbs there? Or Bill, Al McShirley? No, no. No, the, uh, no they, uh, you mean Bill Higgs? Bill, no, Bill Hobbs. Oh. Anyway. No, no, it was. As far as I know, Al McShirley never worked for SNCC. He worked for the, uh, for the Bradens. And in fact, that's where I went. Uh, after, I, I was in SNCC when the um, slogan was that whites should organize whites and blacks should organize blacks, then we'll come together later. And actually, I saw a lot of sense in that. SOC, Southern Students Organizing Committee. Yes. Uh, that's right. I, I think uh, uh, McShirley was with them. But they didn't have much of a presence in Mississippi. And they were generally white. But uh, we both ended up working for SCAF. Could the, you talk a little bit about, just a little bit, because I need, we need to get back to D.C. Well, when I went into, you know, I, I took Stokely at his word. White should organize whites. So I went to Kentucky. Uh, and what, what year? This was 65, right after SNCC fell apart. Um, and I was assigned to Pike County, Kentucky, by Ann and Carl Braden, who were running the project. And I was assigned to do a, what amounted to a feasibility study. Uh, would a SCEF, Southern Conference Educational Fund project, work there? in Pike County. And I stayed there for about six months and I wrote up a report and I said, yes, this is the place to go. Being a piece of cake. People are really ready to be organized. And so Al and at that time Margaret McShirley were assigned to Pike County. And they proceeded to be harassed, have their life threatened, have their office broken into. Um, I told Al years later that you, you were there because I said it was an easy project. Uh, House dynamited. House dynamited. Uh, in the end, they reached a settlement with the government, and went, Al was able to go to law school on that settlement. But at the time, I was totally abashed. I was absolutely wrong in my assessment. Um, after, after that, I, w I again went back to Antioch. Each time I left, I kept dropping out. At least I thought I was dropping out. Each time I came back, Antioch said, no, I had not dropped out. I was on a co-op job. You could not drop out of Antioch. It was like being Jewish. You, can't, you could not drop out no matter what you did. They would not let you drop out. But you had to pay for those co-op job credits. <laughs> um, so I kept thought dropping out and then coming back and, you know, uh, so I came back, uh, and my second uh, job in Washington uh, was working for IPS. This was 65, I guess, late 65, uh, where, when uh, Raskin and Barnett were first, had first set it up. And uh, I was basically the administrative assistant for Raskin and Barnett. And I didn't quite get it. You know, th this was the first time I, I was involved with people who basically thought for a living. Art Waskow was there as a futurist. And Tina Smith was there. Y yes. Uh, well, yes, that's right. But most people were thinkers. And uh, 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 Mark and, and Dick had just come out of, well, a couple years after, I guess, come out of Senator Proxmire's office, and they were experts on foreign policy. Uh, and they were writing these very learned papers. In fact, everybody there was writing learned papers on stuff. And um, I, I, I thought it was nice because nobody was shooting at us. And that was 
to me the difference. Plus, we got to wear suits. It was like clean, you know? Uh, and at the time, one thing they did that I did understand was they had seminars and brought in lots of people. Uh, in, in fact, uh, it was around this time when Frank Smith, uh, uh, Marion Barry, Ivanhoe, myself, although I was coming from a different angle, uh, and several others, Mark gave them all jobs. The way I, I explain it is that, you know, when SNCC fell apart, we were trying to decide what to do. And what we did was voter registration. And what we said was, where do they need voter registration more than a place where they're not even allowed to vote at all? At least in Mississippi, uh, there were certain laws saying that they should vote. Uh, and, and we, you know, we're, we're working for those laws. And we got the, the voting rights bill passed. But in Washington, the law said they could not vote. So we moved here. Was that and the fact that Mark Raskin gave us all jobs. Uh, then I went back to Antioch again. What year? This is late 65, early 66. So you were here for a year and a half? That I Something like that. Something like that. Then I went back to Antioch and, I, you know, I said to everybody, I want a job, I don't want to have a job that's doing harm. In other words, I don't want to mainstream, I don't want to become a broker or anything. But I, but I, w I would like a job where I, I was not in danger of people shooting me or getting beat beaten up, because I'd done that for almost five years. Um, so I got a job with the National Student Association. This was now 67, 68. So Lowenstein was president? No. No. This is long after. Lowenstein, when, actually, I don't think he ever was president. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, 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 Gene Stearns was president. And Bob Kuttner was vice president. And um, uh, I'm blocking names. But uh, one day I get a call from Ramparts Magazine, actually from Bob Avakian, who was that time was a reporter for Ramparts Magazine. Later, he evidently ran a railroad because there was always all signs saying, stop the railroad of Bob Avakian. Uh, no, he became head of the something or another party, the communist something or another party. Uh, communist worker, I forget. But at that time, he was a reporter for, for Ramparts Magazine. His father was a federal judge in San Francisco. He calls me. Uh, we're doing this research. Would you help us out? So I became their inside man. Uh, now, Phil Sherburn, who was the, the previous president, actually, I think, had alerted Ramparts to the CIA involvement. Under Lowenstein. Well. It was like this. My role, the role that I played, was to blow the whistle on the whistleblowers. Phil Sherburn, who came back, and Gene Stearns, who was president, and others were taking the position that the CIA had infiltrated NSA and that uh, Actually, you know, we broke ties with them last year. But every year, we just broke ties with them. I found out, actually, from Al Lowenstein, who came to help us during this period. And he sat us down, and he explained that in 1948, he went to what was then the OSS and said uh, Eastern European communist countries are starting all these student groups. Now all these students were, were World War II veterans. You know, these are older people. And they're going to have uh, 
uh, festivals in Helsinki and elsewhere. And the United States needs to match them. Well, the OSS morphed into the CIA, and he was still having this discussion. And the CIA said to him, well, you're right. We will set something up, but we can't be like the other countries and say that you know, this is sponsored by the nation because this is the United States and we don't do stuff like that. So we're going to do it, but we're going to do it surreptitiously. So it wasn't that the CIA infiltrated NSA. It was that the CIA set up NSA, and it was Al Lowenstein that was the main person that did it. And um, make a long story short, I went to the uh, leaders of NSA who were putting out this line about infiltration and we had just broken and so on. And that line was developed between them and the CIA. I said, if they don't come out and tell the truth that the CIA had set up NSA, I was going to do it. And uh, you were working for them. I was working for them. Uh, but I, they knew, I mean, I told them up front that I was doing this sort of research for ramparts. And the reason I did it because I didn't believe ramparts at first. I wanted to tell them this is a funny, these far left nuts who are accusing of being part of the CIA. But as I looked into it, I found out what I just said. And I went to every meeting uh, th that we had. And at each meeting, well, for the first meeting of the staff, the officers told us, well, uh, we broke with them last year. Then the next meeting, they told us, well, you know, we, we, we started to talk about breaking last year, but actually they still own this building. But, you know, we're in the process of breaking. Then the next one was, well, you know, I just met with them yesterday, and we decided between us to say this. I, well, I took notes at all these meetings. They knew I was taking notes. Fred Milheiser a part of that group? Do you remember? I don't remember. I remember the CIA's agent's name was Bob Kiley. He ended up being vice mayor of Boston. And he was the head of CA5, Covert Activities 5, which was the domestic branch of the CIA, which later, I mean, it was all illegal. The CIA was not supposed to be doing any of this. Later, they passed the law to tighten that up. Um, anyway, uh, they knew I was taking notes. They didn't uh, come out and tell the truth. So through um, uh, Bill Webb, uh, a guy named Webb, W-E-B-B, -B, who worked with NSA, who worked with IPS for a while. Lee Webb. Lee Webb, thank you, thank you. Who I had met at IPS, through him and a couple other people who were more insiders, um, I gave my story to Drew Pearson, actually to Jack Anderson, who was working for Drew Pearson. I went to Jack Anderson's house, I gave him all my notes. Uh, I told the story. Now remember, I had come to this in order so nobody should shoot me or beat me up. And so I, I did all this, and now Jack, I'm sitting at Jack Anderson's house, and he says, when this story comes out, you will be the safest person in America. If you are in a one car, you're driving a car and you're about to have a one car crash, the CIA will jump in front of you. However, until the time that I print this story, you've got to disappear. So I was back with SNCC. I mean, it was the same kind of thing, except at least with SNCC, you could see the Klan coming at you. You know? So, so where, where were you? At, where did you go? I went, I went to Philadelphia. I had been out with friends for a couple months. Oh. I, I forget why they couldn't print the story right away, but for some reason they couldn't. So then I came back to Washington, and I held a press conference in front of the NSA building. Uh, and, uh, you know, the next day the Drew Pearson column appeared. Also, I, I couldn't tell the press because they wanted like an exclusive. So it was announced at this press conference, and they were the first to have the story. Um, and, and it taught me, you know, that what I took to be a bunch of people, that was, and it was very nice, and, and shirts and ties, and you went to work, and they didn't beat you up, and you used, you know, a pencil and, and, instead of 
your boots walking through these red clay roads, you know, that that all exactly wasn't so safe either, you know. Um, each time I came to Washington, um, I, I was involved in the home rule movement and in, you know, the civil rights movement such as it was in Washington. I later came back actually a fourth time as the lobbyist for the United Electrical Workers. I was living in New York, but because I knew where the streets were in Washington. What year was this? This is now 72 or 73. That's when I met, that's when I met Bill Higgs. Now the UE was a very radical union. And um, it wasn't in the AFL, it never was. It was a left-wing union. And here I was being the lobbyist for this left-wing union. Russ Nixon had been the lobbyist for many, many years. Hmm. And, he, and he was known you know, as a communist. Uh, but all that was left of the UE office here was a secretary. So it was me and the secretary. So I'm, it was very few people that, you know, whose offices I could get into to lobby. But Bill Higgs helped me out. And he Do you want to just me say who Bill Higgs was? At the time, he, he was the uh, uh, legislative director of uh, Gus Hawkins' committee. Now, I forget what committee that was, but out of that committee came and Bill Higgs wrote the unemployment bill which later became watered down into the Hawkins-Humphrey bill. Hmm. At the time, the Hawkins bill that Bill Higgs wrote required that there be full employment in the United States or the president had to report to the Congress, why not? The Humphrey-Hawkins bill just said that the president have to report, has to report every year the unemployment rate to the hmm. Congress. But going back earlier, he was, Nick's probably the only white um, lawyer for SNCC. Uh, yes, he was. Uh, he went south. He was a southerner himself. Uh, but he wasn't, he wasn't the only white lawyer. He, he was part of a group of very radical uh, southern lawyers. I learned that, you know, the white south, they might be hard to organize, but once they were organized, man, you couldn't shake them off with a stick. And Bill Higgs was one of those people. Um, once he became radicalized somehow in the South, he really was very courageous. Coming back to Marion Barry, uh, my memory, of course, was that he ran that SNCC office with Tina Smith. Yes. Um, was it Rhode Island Avenue? Yes. What do you have any memories of following his ascendancy to, the, to being the mayor in between the time of is involved in sick and snake and that. Yeah, well, um, yes. Marion Barry was the first chair of SNCC, although technically not. Technically, for six months, he was the chair of what they called the Temporary Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was organized basically by Ella Baker in Raleigh, North Carolina in 1960. Um, it became the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee about six months later with the help of uh, Jenkins, uh, who is actually, um, what's his name? Uh, I know you know him. He lives on Logan Circle. Tim Jenkins? Tim Jenkins, huh, name from the past. Um, and at the time, they he, helped, he and several other people helped set up SNCC. They were working for the National Student Association. Mm -hmm. And they uh, gave money through SNCC, to SNCC through the Southern Project of the National Student Association. So there's a, there's a CIA SNCC connection. Well, here's my take on that. <laughs> um, and it's like this. When I was growing up in Philadelphia, Everybody knew where the bookie joints were. They were always behind a florist shop or, or, or 
a sandwich shop. If you wanted to go to a bookie, you went behind. But if you wanted a sandwich only, they would make you a great sandwich. Or if the, the best bouquets in the world came out of there if you just wanted flowers. This is the way it was with this, the CIA and, and SNCC. Turns out the reason they gave money to SNCC was that was their flower shop. Uh, and, and really they didn't monitor too much what SNCC was doing with the money. What they were really interested in was that their operatives, and sometimes their operatives didn't even know they were operatives, um, in, at that time, Latin America were working with Latin America student associations to undermine them. At that, that time, there's revolutionary students in most Latin American countries. And they would say, I'm from NSA. We are the people that are helping SNCC. And that gave them their bona fides. So as long as we're not killed between here and when we leave, when Stokely went to Africa, do you think some of that was, was CIA? slash snake money? Possibly, but you know, I, I've come to learn that just because you say something is CIA money doesn't really mean that the CIA was in control of it. I also learned that the way the CIA operated was they put money into everything. There's very few things you can name in the world that there wasn't CIA money in. There was CIA money in the Communist Party of Russia. And they did it on spec. They had so much money, they could put money everywhere, and all they wanted was little reports from somebody or another, you know. Um, and, that's, and that's all they got. Chump change. Chump, yeah. Um, Coming back to Marion, though. Uh, so, so I, 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 you actually got me off. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's fascinating. Uh, so he was. It's fascinating stuff. So he was the chair of the temporary student nonviolent coordinator. Uh, then, under Tim Jenkins, it became the permanent one, and was Chuck McDo. Uh, Marion stayed in Mississippi for a short time after that, but then fundamentally became the, the, the head and the, and the uh, coordinator of Friends of SNCC in the North, which is very important. This was the fundraising operation of SNCC other than what we got from the National Student Association. It was one of the reasons that SNCC could be so independent, no matter who was giving them the money, because we had our own fundraising, fundraising sources. Um, some people said they knew some of that money was from the CIA, and they thought, shit, we'll take their money and do whatever we want with it, which they did. But uh, other money came from everywhere, and Marion did that. And he was the first SNCC person that I knew of that had the insight that you could apply what we were doing in the South to the North. Now, others said they were doing it, like Tom Hayden had the Northern Student Organizing Committee, and the, he had ERAP. E ERAP. Yes, uh, and, and he had uh, urban projects in New Jersey and so forth. Newark, yeah. Newark. Yeah, it was under SDS. And yes, and they called that doing what SNCC was doing in the South, but actually it wasn't. Uh, you know, it was under so, so much different circumstances um, that we didn't see that as an extension of SNCC. We did see what Marion was doing as an extension of SNCC because it was in the context of Washington, which had no rights. Uh, that was real community organizing under conditions that were similar to the South. And Marion had that insight that he could do that, uh, mostly to support SNCC work. But at the same time, he was building uh, a, uh, his career here. Um, and when Ivanhoe started a stop having elected Carl Stokes, and I forget everybody else who was the first black mayor of this town and first black mayor of that town, he settled in Washington. Ivanhoe worked with Marion. What year? I want to say 66 or 67. I'm not sure. I remember him. 
film called Ivanhoe. Yeah, but that was when he was an organizer for SNCC. Mm -hmm. That was shown, in fact, in Oxford as a training film. And nobody knows what happened to that film, by the way. If you could find a copy of it, we'd all be grateful. Even Ivanhoe doesn't know, has, doesn't have a copy. Anyway, so Ivanhoe was a real, genuine political operative. As a matter of fact, he was the head of the Holly Springs Project. Every other project talked in terms of, we are here to change people's spirits. Um, Bob Moses was speaking in those terms. We're here to change people, to empower people. Uh, Ivanhoe came down with two things. First of all, a map. He said, if you have a map of a place, you can organize it. He had a map of Marshall County and surrounding counties. And secondly, he had a tally sheet. He said, we are here to help people register to vote. And we are going to work four hours a day at doing it. And we are going to um, uh, uh, try to register such and so many people. He couldn't say register them because we were fighting laws against it. But we, we will bring X number of people to the courthouse. That was our job. And that was Ivanhoe. And he was the only SNCC leader like that. It was very clear. And when he became the um, uh, campaign manager for all these people, it was no surprise. This is what he did. Uh, and he settled in Washington. I believe he worked at IPS as well. I think we all did at one time or another. Um, and he saw in Marion a, uh, a real future. In fact, I don't know if either one will admit this, but at one time Ivanhoe said, Marion has to run for office because I'm too ugly. Ivanhoe said of himself. Um, but, uh, you know, Ivanhoe was the, the political strategist. Marion was the politician. Marion had the ability to have, have everybody in Washington know him and, and love him. And, you know, he was a real people's person. Ivanhoe was a strategist. Was there, do you think, a, a plan, actually, for Marion to go from what he was doing as friends of SNCC to UPO to, uh, to mayor? Was that a long-term strategy? I would, I, I, I have no first-hand recollection, but I would bet the farm, because Ivanhoe was involved, and because Ivanhoe was a political strategist, that there absolutely was that Ivanhoe at one point said to Marion, you will be mayor of this town someday. Do you think that? Absolutely. Um, what was, uh, what was I, I think Ivanhoe? it was, I think he went to the uh, school board first. Uh, yeah, yeah, he elected to the school board in 68. Yeah. What was uh, Ivanhoe convicted of? Why did he? Well, he, he became um, uh, assistant mayor, or vice mayor, I forget the term, so to Marion. Yeah, and um, you know, the amount involved was thirty-five thousand dollars. He went to jail for three years, mm. and it all had to do with taking kickbacks from contractors. And uh, he signed checks and other people's names. Everybody involved, the people whose names he signed, said, he, "If he had asked me, I would have given him permission to sign my name." He, uh, John Heckinger, one of the richest men in Washington at that time, ran Heckinger's lumber yards, said, if Ivanhoe needed the money, I would have given it to him. He didn't have to do any of this. He was very beloved. Um, Let me ask you a question. I have a theory as to what happened, but... You were ideologically driven from the time you were born. I just wonder. I used to say, let me jump in a minute. When I was in the South, I said, you know, everybody around me has faith. I have a political analysis. Faith keeps you warm at night and keeps you going. 
political analysis keeps you awake at night and makes you nervous. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm just wondering, you pretty much kept your ideals all of your life, all of your works. You could trace it back to birth. It's ideologically driven. However... But I wouldn't use that term. Okay, that's... An ideology is, um, you know, a, a, a world view that, that has many parts. It has analysis, it has practice, uh, it has a map to the future. That's an ideology. Um, I was born not exactly with an ideology, but just with the idea that, number one, the world was wrong because the people that were producing the wealth weren't getting the wealth. That's simple. And number two, if we got together and worked together and stayed together, we could change things. That was it. And um, I don't know if that's an ideology, well, but it's, it is what it is. But, but I can't imagine you accepting a $50,000 bribe from a developer or a realtor or taking money on the side. Well, but you have to understand something. Ivanhoe and Marion, in fact, I just had a recent conversation with somebody about the same thing. They had all been fighting in the South against things that were the law. Segregation was the law. We were arrested for breaking the law, and we were guilty. So the fact of something being a law didn't necessarily make it right. We had a different attitude towards what was the law. Also, and more so than, than me, they did, because they really were on the front lines. I mean, I was on the front lines from time to time. I got beaten up, I was put in jail. Senator Eastland gave a speech about how I was a communist. But day to day, you know, Ivanhoe and, and Bob Moses and others were literally risking their lives just walking outside the door. I don't think in their minds they quite made the transition from, you know, fighting the man to being the man. They didn't quite get that. And I think, that, you know, their mentality at the time, it's completely different today. Now, they both understand, you know, that they are in power. I say Ivanhoe is too because he, he is a uh, consultant to many leading politicians. But I, I believe at the time that they were still fighting the fight. And, um, you know, what was legal and that was kind of fuzzy. You know, I just, uh, we're, 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 we should be winding down. But I do remember being in a high-stakes high card game <laughs> with uh, Marion, Ivanhoe, Al McShirley, and a couple of others. And I said, and this, No, Carl Bernstein. Oh, I wasn't okay. there, but I, I knew Carl. But there was so much money on the table, and I was making so little. I was making nothing, very little. And I said, how did he, how, I was, was that much money. But I said, these guys are different. They're, they're, there's money, and it's big money, and high stakes. And well, that could have been a temptation. Well, to maybe, but uh, first of all, today, Marion is broke, and, but he's still serving the people of Washington. Right, and this is probably 64, 65, yeah. I'm thinking of. Um, and Ivanhoe is too, just about, and he's still in the movement and doing some very good things. Um, you know, 
we, you and I, and, and I think what I described is my motivation, basically comes more from Europe. My working class. Working class Europe, European way of thinking, co the collectivities, rather than the individualistic um, American ideals where your success um, means, you know, the success of your people as well. Um, you know, you and I were very close, well, we're second generation, you know, to Russia. We hardly have our big toe in this country. And we've, you know, we have certain ways of thinking that are not from this country. African Americans in general, uh, probably, if you think about it, have the most American culture of them all. Because when they were kidnapped here, uh, they weren't allowed to maintain whatever culture they had in Africa. You know, they were mixed up with people. They had to invent a culture. And what they did was invented really the most American of all American cultures with roots in Africa, you know, but um, whatever is good about America, whatever is bad about America, uh, is even more so, you know, in, in, in the African American culture. And I think that makes absolute sense that it would be. Uh, yeah, you, you know, I mean, you had great organizers, I'm not saying that, that, that they didn't, but you know, they, they, they were more real than we are. Yeah, I've, I've always been an outsider to American culture. Yeah. I mean, this, we're over, but this has turned out to be a very, it's gone in a very different place than I yeah, this is thought of in terms of this interview. So I, is there anything else? You know, I didn't ask you, or maybe I did, uh, marriages, children, grandchildren, anything you want to add about that? Well, checkered. Uh, I, um, I've suffered from the movement uh, uh, problem of, you know, having a, a, a complex private life. Not everybody has. Ivanhoe is a perfect example. Somebody's been married forever. Uh, I have two daughters. Uh, one is in Hollywood, and she is a producer, uh, and is back to actually give me my first grandchild, wow. May 3rd. Um, but she's about, you know, what Hollywood's about. And my other daughter, my younger daughter, who's African American, she's adopted, um, is a special ed teacher in Dover, Delaware. and. I have been embarrassing both my daughters their entire lives by coming to their schools and talking about civil rights. They were highly embarrassed when I did that, particularly my younger daughter. Uh, so there you have it. You, you and I once appeared in the synagogue together to talk about Kofo Summer. How do we feel about it? Well, this is, uh, this is great. Thanks for coming. Yeah.